From the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., The Congressional Report, with your host, Iowa Congressman Tom Latham. This country is based on farms, on small businesses, and creating jobs and opportunities. That is the lifeblood of this nation. And now your host, Congressman Tom Latham. Hi, welcome to the Congressional Report. The men and women who currently serve and have served in our country's armed forces have made incredible sacrifices that most of us can't even imagine. They leave behind their families, their jobs, and their communities to protect the freedoms and rights so central to our democracy. And all too often they return home after their tours bearing the wounds, both physical and emotional, that they received in the defense of our country. We owe veterans our sincerest gratitude and respect for the sacrifices they made in our behalf. But our debt to veterans doesn't stop there. We owe them every resource available so they can transition smoothly into life after the military. That means offering the top-notch health care, job training programs, and education benefits they were promised when they made the commitment to serve our nation. But our veterans programs sometimes fall short of that ideal. Bureaucratic inefficiency and a lack of understanding of veterans' needs often get in the way of delivering the best services we can provide. We must do everything we can to correct those flaws. Veterans put everything on the line for our country, and we owe them no less. Joining me on this month's program to talk about veterans' issues is Steve Robertson, the Legislative Director for the American Legion. Steve, welcome to the Congressional Report. It's great to have you with us today. And uh, uh, would you give us a little background about yourself and uh, how you became the Legislative Director for the American Legion? I was serving in the military uh, on active duty in the United States Air Force in North Dakota, and I married a young lady who was also an officer. She got assigned to the Pentagon. I got out of the Air Force and. Uh, we moved to Washington, D.C., and fortunately, right time, right place, I went to work for the American Legion. Uh, I had been a member of the American Legion many years before actually coming to work for them, but I've been with them for 21 years now, and I've been the legislative director for about 15. You're from Louisiana, by your uh, hat there? Uh, yes, sir. I attended Bird High School and Louisiana Tech University, played a little basketball at both of them, and uh, went straight into the military right after college. That's great. Well, it's great to have you with us. Give us a little history of the American Legion, how it started, what, uh, uh, how did we get to where we are today? It actually began in France in 1919. Uh, it, a lot of the World War I veterans had seen firsthand how veterans had been treated coming back from previous wars. And they wanted to make sure that especially the veterans that were wounded received timely and, and adequate health care. They also were concerned about the survivors, the widows and the orphans uh, of those uh, veterans that were killed uh, over in France. Uh, and, and the organization, if you recall, was the group that fought the war to end all wars. Mm -hmm. So they really organized in hopes of never having any more new members, that it would be just members of World War I and that would be it. Unfortunately, we've had other conflicts that has kept our membership uh, alive and, uh, and, and functional. But their main focus was on children and youth, uh, a na strong national defense, taking care of veterans, and a lot of Americanisms uh, issues, uh, making sure that flag education was taught mm -hmm. in schools, the Pledge of Allegiance was taught in schools, uh, studying of the Constitution. So a lot of the programs that we had were, at, in the, from the very beginning, were designed to take care of the community, and it was strictly a community-based operation. Well, what are some of the, the big issues that uh, you hear from veterans, not necessarily from here in Washington, but when you're out and around and you listen to, to your members, what, what are they talking about today? Well, you know, I'm really in many ways happy when I go out to the field and get to listen to the, to the Legionnaires talk because when I first came to work for the American Legion, the biggest complaint I got was about the quality of care in VA facilities. Now I'm hearing people ask me how do I get into the VA health care system and many of them view that as their best health care option. Uh, they have other options but they choose to go to the VA because of the quality of care. The, mm -hmm. the patient satisfaction rating is through the roof. 
Uh, but the big complaint is there's not enough facilities. I live in a rural part of the country. How do I get in? Um, and, and those are issues that we're still trying to fight today. The other part is about the war. Um, the American Legion is dedicated to making sure that we don't make the same mistakes that we made with the Vietnam generation, where we blame the soldier mm -hmm. for the politics. Mm -hmm. So we have been very diligent in trying to make sure that we support the men and women of our armed forces, the leaders that are in the theater that are supposed to be leading the conflict, and making sure that the families back home are taken care of. Uh, in fact, we started, when the first Gulf War started, uh, we started a family support network within the American Legion where you called a toll-free number, and if you needed the snow tires put on your, your vehicle, a local Legion post would show up and, and put on those snow tires or put up the storm windows or mow the lawn. Or if, it, if you just needed a break from taking care of the kids, mm -hmm. they would come in and babysit for you while you went shopping. So it was really an effort by the American Legion to reach out beyond the military bases because we had so many National Guard and Reservists that were activated, we wanted to be there to help them in their time of need. And as we've gone from one operation to where we are now with Afghanistan and Iraq, we're still there doing the same thing. Yeah. And thank you for doing that. It is, uh, uh, you, you talked about how the uh, veterans coming back from Vietnam and the, the treatment then, but it is really heartwarming today, I think, to see the kind of respect that is shown to our veterans coming back today. I mean, it really, uh, that means so much to them and really means so much to our country to honor those people. I go sit at airports and I hear people, you know, saying thank you to the people in uniform and and uh, applauding them, it's, it's really uh, a great thing. I'd like to mention one other thing that we're doing. The kids that are wounded that are going to Walter Reed, Bethesda, and other military mm -hmm. hospitals, a lot of times their unit gets back way before they get out of their hospital rehabilitation. The Legion has set up a program where when we know a kid is leaving Walter Reed or, or Bethesda or wherever, we try to set up a homecoming for them back in their, in their hometown. And Absolutely. working with other veterans organizations and other community groups, we have parades and, and the welcome home that's specifically designed for the for the soldier that came back later, and it kind of falls in line with that military philosophy of don't leave anybody behind. So the unit comes home, has a big parade, everybody gets their hugs and kisses, and we make sure that when the last guy comes back or gal comes back, that there's somebody there to greet them as well. That's tremendous, and thank you for doing that. Uh, uh, here in Washington, uh, there's always legislation pending, but uh, uh, what, what do you see as you know, some of the things that could really be a benefit to the American Legion, to your members? Uh, and maybe there's some things out there that uh, aren't so helpful that uh, are on the agenda. What, what do you see happening here? Well, we're very pleased with the VA appropriations. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, we, we, we actually got the appropriations before the start of the uh, fiscal okay. year, which was a major, major accomplishment. Right. Uh, we've had a tough time making that happen. This year we've been very, very fortunate that both the House and the, and the Senate has agreed to include language for advanced appropriations specifically for the VA medical portion of it. Uh, that means that we already know how much money VA would be getting for their health care system in the next fiscal year. So all we have to do is iron out the rest of the budget, but when that fiscal year starts if the rest of the appropriations package isn't done, at least the health care right. portion of it is done, and that was a tremendous benefit. Right. Uh, we have other things that we're really trying to accomplish uh, dealing with the claims and, and adjudication process. We, as you know, that there's a growing backlog. In, in fact, we're about to hit the one million mark on delayed claims, uh, waiting for those to be resolved. We're trying to figure out how to best fix this problem. Um, Part of it is because we've lost a lot of adjudicators, experienced adjudicators, mm -hmm. and we're bringing brand new young men and women in to fill those roles. And it takes a while before they become proficient. And when I say a while, we're getting, talking anywhere from two to three years before they're really qualified to handle the more difficult cases. Uh, we're also looking at ways that we might be able to use automation to kind of speed up the process. But it's a very labor intense uh, process uh, that requires a lot of subjective human decision making along the way. So, you know, we don't want to throw it into a, a robot like the Space Odyssey and turn it over to HAL. I mean, we, we really want young men and women right. to sit there, look at the cases, make sure all the evidence is there, 
and that a fair and equitable adjudication is made and it is right the first time. And, and that uh, really goes to like, disability processing times, everything that you're talking about. But that's the hang up there, is it the, yes, and, the and, backlog? And there's also another problem, and, and when I say a problem, in before Desert Storm, most veterans filed a claim. It was for one, maybe two conditions. But warfare has changed, and now when young men and women come back, because of PTSD, traumatic brain injury, uh, exposures to toxic uh, elements, uh, now claims are a little bit more complicated. Uh, TBI, the traumatic brain injury, which is the new medical condition that's out there, a lot of times a veteran may not even know he, he or she has it. Mm -hmm. And it's the family members that are observing strange behavior, things that they, they say, that you know, my soldier never did that before. Right. and it's most of the time the family that's bringing the veteran to the VA rather than the veteran coming in and saying something's wrong. So those kinds of, of medical conditions are a little bit more technical and require a little bit more justification to award the disability compensation. But more important than the compensation is the treatment. Um, there's been a stigma about PTSD, traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Um, and we in the American Legion, and, and I, I might add DOD, is now encouraging more and more of our combat veterans to seek mental health. There's nothing wrong with seeking mental health. And a lot of times, the earlier you can address the problem, the better the, the solution as far as being able to live with it. Um, with our multiple deployments, if a person develops a PTSD in their first tour, and they don't get help until their third or fourth or fifth rotation, it may be more difficult to deal with. You know, uh, you had mentioned earlier, but uh, in talking uh, one issue certainly that I have in my district and I think throughout rural America uh, is the access for uh, veterans who are a long way from VA facility, I mean, distance. The, uh, you know, up in northeast part of the state that, you know, oftentimes they'll have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to meet in Decorah, Iowa to get on a bus or a van to go to Iowa City at 5.30 in the morning. And, uh, you know, somebody in the, on the van has an appointment at nine o'clock, another one has one at four in the afternoon. They all have to wait all day and then come back. It can be a very, you know, 13, 14 hour And that's day. if there's good weather. If there's good weather, <laughs> exactly, right. Oh, what, what's the best way to address that? You know, it's not just a problem with the veterans community. It's a national problem for everyone, rural health care. Uh, one of the things, the secretary already has the authority that he can contract out services in a local area if there's a problem with the veteran getting to a VA facility. Um, the, since, I guess, 1992-93 time frame, VA is really focused on developing community-based uh, outpatient clinics. Uh, the C boxes, as mm -hmm. they're referred to, and that has really moved VA healthcare closer to the veteran in the field. They've also come up with mobile clinics, which are able to go into local communities and provide, you know, f uh, outpatient type services. For the really serious conditions, we pretty much have to bring them to a, a VA medical a center where the specialists are located and, and recovery time can take place uh, in an inpatient setting. Uh, we are looking at other options. Um, the American Legion has advocated teaming up with military bases where the VA hospital may be at one end of the state and there be a military base at the other end of the state, working out some kind of agreement between DOD and VA that maybe veterans could access the military health care uh, facility. Um, there's other options that, that we've been trying to you know, come up with the, the solution. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you remember during the presidential campaign, we were kind of concerned about uh, a suggestion that Senator McCain had made about a credit card. Uh, and, and I guess the, the problem we had was is the quality of care, making sure that the veteran is getting the best quality of care. If you give somebody a credit card, it's, you're not always sure who's going to be at the other end of that. And if, God forbid, that, that provider were to create a greater injury to that veteran, if the VA didn't send them there, you know, the VA is not liable for them. So what we would rather see is that we make sure that the VA is in the loop because of the, you know, the VA has electronic medical records. Not all doctors deal with that. Uh, VA, you know, we have specialists inside the system. A doctor in a local community may not be up to speed on dealing with something like Gulf War illness or, right. or something along that line. 
So uh, it's, it's a problem that needs to be addressed, and, and we're going to work with other veteran service organizations to see if we can come up with the best solution. The VA should be a model for any kind of health care reform as far as medical rec records because you do have, it's the one system that, that works and uh, is nationwide and is, uh, you should be commended for getting that, that accomplished. It, we, it's huge. We were visiting with the secretary the other day and the mo mobile vans, they just added 50 new mobile vans to the inventory. They're equipping them with antennas that allow them to access uh -huh. anywhere that they're able to set up connectivity. So right. I think that there's going to be a really a bright future uh, it, for may, may making the system more accessible to more mm -hmm. veterans. The, uh, th there's a pilot program going on right now as far as veterans and their, uh, you talked about the credit card and the concerns that you have, and I, I fully appreciate that. Uh, there's a pilot program for veterans to, if, if they decide, if they choose, to go to a local health care provider and uh, my assumption is that that health care provider has been approved by the VA that they can go to but uh, is that working out have you seen any details on that well it makes the the the, the, the veterans happy because it saves like right. you say the long trip and right. I think that we have to wait till all the information is in the uh, again the part that I'm worried about is making sure all the medical records of when they see somebody right. at a contracted service that all of it is accurately uh, transmitted to the VA and, and put into their medical records Okay. Uh, there's a proposal uh, basically to expand TRICARE eligibility uh, to soldiers up to a year before deployment and that you're supporting that I mean, I obviously at I, I want to share a little story with you. When I was in the D.C. National Guard, I was federalized to go to Desert Storm. And I, you know, one day I'm in the, on Capitol Hill, the next right. day I'm in the desert. Uh, when we were getting ready to mobilize... Some would suggest that might be the same place yeah. <laughs> yeah. around here. But, but, uh, yeah. the, the, at least the bullets over there were real. Well, <laughs> I, I don't. Well, that's true. But the, uh, the point I was going to make is that a lot of our kids, when we were mobilizing them, I was shocked as to how many of them had no private health care insurance right. and many of them had not really had a medical evaluation since they went to basic training and some of these guys were 35 40 years old we had one kid that had seven teeth extracted before we deployed mm -hmm. because he hadn't been to the dentist since basic right. training and I wish that there was a way that we could expand the TRICARE system to cover guard and reservist because right now guard and reservists are doing a lot of the heavy lifting over in Iraq and Afghanistan and it would seem to me that it would be a pound wise yeah. to have them medically fit before right. we need to mobilize them. Right. So allowing them access into the into the TRICARE system and keeping them in it, there. Actually, uh, it was my my bill uh, a couple of years ago where we did get the at least the start right. of that going on uh, over in the Senate with Lindsey Graham and uh, uh, Senator Clinton uh, here uh, with Gene Taylor from Mississippi and myself. Uh, actually, they do. They, they are able to purchase into the Tricare system today, uh, and, and it's huge for them because, like you said, the biggest problem we have is the it's dental is the biggest reason that people are not ready to be deployed when they're called, as far as the Guard and Reserve. But ain't, you don't have to be deployed to have access to. Tricare now they can purchase it. Well, the other thing that I see would be a great benefit is employers. If I oh, work for absolutely. a small business and yeah. I'm able to bring my own health care coverage right. to them as a guard yeah. and reservist, you know the employer is going to be a little, little bit pleased right. when he sure. knows that when you're deployed, your family is already covered with the same insurance you had when you were there. Right. So they're not having to worry about transferring people back and forth and worrying about pre-existing conditions and any war-related medical problems that the veteran may have when he comes mm -hmm. back. That impacts on their private health care insurance. So if you've got something that is yours all the time, not just before you're activated or after you're activated, having it 24-7 yeah. seems to make sense. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing, I, you know, a lot of concern, and you, you talked about it earlier, but uh, uh, the mental health issues that some of our soldiers have to come back and the brain injuries and all that. Uh, did, is it getting the focus and the attention that deserves? Do you think, or the uh, within the within the VA healthcare system and the military healthcare system? Absolutely, uh, we're beginning to see commanders stepping up and saying, "I'm going to a mental health appointment 
and making sure that their troops know that know that I'm going therefore it's not bad for you to go too but the big problem is the stigma people are so afraid that it's going to compromise security clearances that it's going to keep them from getting promoted right. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you you don't go into combat and come back the same mm -hmm. and some people it's just like playing sports some people can bounce back from an injury and others it takes a little longer but the trick is understanding your body and being able to deal with the stress and the pressures I've been to combat and I know that I came back changed and I have seen it in all my friends that, that serve with me and there is absolutely nothing wrong and I would encourage family members to that if they have a spouse that's you know flying off the handle a little quicker than what they did before they went over I would definitely say honey you need to go in and see somebody because I really think that you need to talk to somebody about your experiences and and let's address this issue now rather than waiting until it may be too late. Yeah. The, and the uh, frustration, uh, uh, there's a, an initiative to have a hotline for post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the uh, frustration I had, and actually had an amendment under the VA appropriations bill to encourage the VA to move quickly to get this established because the, that hotline could be the family calling the hotline or the soldier themselves but uh, and they're going to be talking to a veteran when they call in there but they have not moved very quickly as far as getting that established and uh, it, it is so critical that they have it, access just think about it we have emergency rooms for physical injuries right. why right. not have a virtual emergency room for mental right. issues well there's a suicide hotline but in my mind that's you're getting beyond where that, you should you're absolutely be I mean, right that you know let's Let's treat it before it gets to that point, and that's a critical issue as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the national commander from Ames, Iowa, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Dave uh, Rybine, and uh, it, tell us about him and how's what kind of a year has he had? I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> they broke the mold when they made Commander <laughs> Rybine. Uh, he is uh, a very bright guy. Uh, he's very uh, savvy with uh, electronic communications. Um, uh, I, you know, I'll get a message from him and I'm looking at my thing and say, what's he doing up at one o'clock in the morning? But I know that he's somewhere around the world uh, communicating with us. Uh, he is very focused on the veterans, uh, especially those in harm's way. He just got back from visiting the troops in Iraq. I uh, spent, I think it was three days over mm -hmm. there. Um, he is always looking for some way to make it a little better for them. Uh, under his watch, we've uh, started a program called uh, Operation Comfort Warrior in which we're buying uh, iPods, uh, deep portable DVD players, um, sweat sweatsuits with hoods for the wounded soldiers that are going through rehabilitation. Uh, a lot of the GIs complain that when they've got prostheses that, you know, having something that can keep them warm and easy to get on and off. Uh, that's not part of the military wardrobe, mm -hmm. so we get them the hoodies, uh, the, the sweatshirts that they can wear. It's much easier to get on and off. The sweatpants fits over the prosthesis uh, with plenty of room to spare. Um, we've been actively soliciting contributions from legionnaires and, and, and people that aren't veterans uh, to this fund. Uh, initially, Commander Rabine set up a modest goal of about 25000 I think the last I heard, we're up to about 170,000 uh, men and women across the United States have stepped forward and said, let us do what we can do to help. That, that's tremendous. We are extremely proud of him, that's for sure. Well, you know, you had another past national commander from Iowa, uh, Don Johnson, uh, right. who passed away right. several years ago and happened his last uh, days. He lived down in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where I live right now. Yeah. And uh, he was another yeah, outstanding, him outstanding gentleman. Quite well, yeah. Yeah, we're very proud of the service that they've uh, they've given to the to the legion to the country. That's for sure. Uh, what what about today, when the veterans come back, uh, as far as finding employment? Do you work with on that side of it as trying to help uh, the veterans when they come back from Afghanistan and Iraq to be able to find jobs? I mean, it's obviously the economy is. Uh, struggling and it's very difficult. Is there anything that that you're doing or programs that you've initiated? The American Legion has partnered with other organizations and are doing job fairs all around the country. And it's really ironic. A few years ago, when we started these, we might have 20 employers show up and maybe 50 veterans. But now it's the other way around. We're getting like 300 
veterans showing up and, mm. and there's not as many businesses that are showing up. You know, people ask me, what can I do to help? Well, if you're an employer, hire veterans. If you work for a big company, tell that company a veteran is the best investment you can make. They're certifiably drug-free, they're trainable, they understand teamwork, mm -hmm. they're loyal. Right. The list, I could go on forever telling you why I would rather have five veterans working for me than five non-veterans. No, and that's uh, so important, I think, for, to uh, emphasize that these are the best employees you'll ever have. They're people, and, and basically also the advantage we talked about before, if they're still in the Guard or Reserve, they don't have access to health insurance themselves. Now, the employer is allowed to pick the, the, the co-payment part of it up, but uh, actually much less expensive than what probably they're purchasing uh, outside the system. So uh, I, I think that is extremely important. Uh, I, t you know, this time flies way too fast here, and I could visit all day with you about this because it's so critical what uh, we do to support our men and women who, who sacrifice so much for our country. And uh, I am just, you know, really pleased to have you here. And, and uh, I don't know if you have any final comment or anything, but uh, we we really appreciate your your being with us today on the congressional well, report. We Oh, the American Legion appreciates your service, and we know that we have a friend whenever we need to talk about issues that are critical, that your door is always open, right. and you're always willing to listen. And working together, we'll make it better for the American veteran and their families. Very good. Thank you so much Thank for you, being with us today. My pleasure. We owe veterans the very best services we can provide them, but our current veteran system leaves much room for improvement. Veterans' health care is often plagued by inefficiencies and bureaucracy. Psychological care continues to lag behind physical care. And veterans make up a disproportionate part of the homeless population in this country. We can do better than that. We can offer veterans new services that take mental health every bit as seriously as physical health. We can streamline and enhance the VA health care process to make sure veterans get the care when they need it and the best care possible. And we can provide better job training and education opportunities. The men and women who have answered our country's call to duty deserve the best. It's time we gave it to them. Thank you for joining me on the Congressional Report. From the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., this has been the Congressional Report with Iowa Congressman Tom Latham. Have a question, comment, or concern? Congressman Latham wants to hear from you.